mengumumkan perarakan masuk ke Dewan yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Nazamid Saari, Timbalan Naib Chancellor Pendidikan dan Inovasi Universiti Putra Malaysia diiringi dihidup kehormat. Para hadirin dimohon berdiri. Nyanyian lagu Negaraku dan Putra Gemilang Para hadirin dipersilakan duduk. Indah berbalam si awan petang berarak di celah pepohon ara. Pemanis kalam selamat datang. Awal bismillah pembuka bicara. Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr Nazamit Saari, Timbalan Naib Chancellor Pendidikan dan Inovasi Universiti Putra Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr Shuhaimi Mustafa Dekan Fakulti Bioteknologi dan Sains Biomolekul yang diraihkan 
yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Ling, pegawai-pegawai kanan universiti dan ahli pengurusan fakulti, tetamu jemputan wakil kementerian dan rakan-rakan industri, para pegawai akademik dan sidang hadirin yang dihormati sekalian. Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera. Selamat datang diucapkan kepada para hadirin ke Majlis Syarahan Inaugural Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Ling Assembling the Jigsaw Puzzle of Crop Plants and Seaweed Functional Genomics. Bagi memohon keberkatan majlis pada pagi ini, dipersilakan yang berusaha Profesor Madya Dr. Muhammad Faizal Ibrahim untuk memimpin bacaan doa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Al-Fatihah. A'udzubillahiminasyaitonirrajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. Maliki yaumitin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina siratal mustaqim. Siratal ladhina an'amta alaihim. Khairil ma'dubi alaihim. Waladhalim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim Engkau lah yang mempunyai segala kepujian Engkau lah yang berhak menerima segala kesyukuran Engkau lah yang memiliki segala pemerintahan Di tangan engkau lah segala kebajikan dan kepada engkaulah kembali segala urusan Kami memanjatkan kesyukuran kepadamu Ya Allah Kerana mengizinkan kami untuk mengadakan Dan berada dalam majlis syarahan inaugural Prof. Dr. Ho Chai Ling Yang bertajuk Assembling the Jigsaw Puzzle of Crop Plants and Seaweed Functional Genomics Ya Allah, Ya Tuhan kami Bersempena dengan majlis syarahan inaugural ini kami memohon inayah dan taufik hidayahmu Kurniakanlah kesejahteraan dan kebahagiaan kepada kami Berikanlah kami kekuatan dan ketekunan dalam perjuangan mencari ilmu pengetahuan Menyebarkan informasi dan berkongsi hasil penyelidikan Untuk memupuk komuniti masyarakat yang berpengetahuan luas dan berkemahiran tinggi Dalam suasana kehidupan yang muhibah Di samping itu, Ya Allah Bukakanlah hati kami dan lapangkanlah dada kami untuk menerima ilmu dan pengetahuan serta bimbingan dalam membentuk kami menjadi insan yang berilmu dan berbakti. Ya Allah yang maha kaya lagi maha bijaksana, kami memohon kepadamu agar engkau memberkati majlis ini dengan limpahan pemurah dan penyayangmu, agar majlis ini berjalan lancar dan baik. Semoga usaha kecil kami ini Memberi faedah dan kebaikan kepada semua Dan kurniakanlah kejayaan dan keberkatan Untuk mengiringi usaha murni kami ini Rabbana atina fi dunia hasanah Wa fil akhirati hasanah Wa qina azaban nar Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Amin ya rabbal alamin Majlis merakamkan ucapan terima kasih kepada yang berusaha Profesor Badia Dr. Faizal Ibrahim atas bacaan doa sebentar tadi. Hadirin sekalian, dengan segala hormatnya, majlis ingin mempersilakan yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Nazamit Saari, Timbalan Naib Chancellor Universiti Putra Malaysia untuk mempengerusikan majlis syarahan inaugural ini dan seterusnya mempersilakan yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Ling untuk menyampaikan syarahan beliau. Majlis dengan segala hormatnya mempersilakan. Terima kasih. Saudara pengajar majlis Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Suhaimi Mustafa Dekan Fakulti Baitan Tim Sains Baimualikun 
yang berbagai Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Ling yang uh, diraihkan pada hari ini kerana akan menyampaikan saran beliau Perkara-perkara keadaan Universiti Putera Malaysia saya nampak Datin Khatijah tadi Datuk Raha ini sebagai satu sokongan yang uh, kuat kepada fakulti terima kasih semua tetamu uh, jemput tetamu jemputan rakan industri para uh, staff pelajar-pelajar uh, senang penonton yang dikasihi sekalian pertama sekali marilah kita memanjatkan kesyukuran kita kepada Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala dengan lempah kurnianya kita dapat bersama-sama berkumpul pada pagi ini dan diberi peluang untuk uh, meneruskan usaha yang saya kira sangat penting bagi meningkatkan kesarjanaan ilmu ya yeah? intellectual discourse which is very important for us ya yeah? uh, pencambahan ilmu jadi saya uh, ingin uh, membaca latar belakang Profesor Dr Ho Chai Ling uh, dalam majlis ini Uh, Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Ling dilahirkan di Kajang Orang dekat saja Di Kajang Selangor Beliau merupakan anak sulung daripada Lima adik-beradik Kepada pasangan Encik Ho Ming Fat dan Puan Wong Yuk Ching Dan beliau telah pun uh, Berkahwin Dengan pasangannya Dr. Chia Leong Wan Dan mempunyai dikenakan dua orang cahaya mata Profesor Dr. Ho mendapat pendidikan awal di Sekolah Rendah Jenis Kebiasaan Yu Hua, Kajang. Seterusnya menyambungkan pelajaran di Sekolah di sekolah Menengah Sultan Abdul Aziz Shah, uh, SAS Kajang dan Sekolah Menengah Sipak Petaling Jaya. Sehingga beliau uh, menamatkan pengajian di peringkat STPM pada 1987. Ya, yeah. 1987, I completed my first degree. So you can... <laughs> so boleh, boleh bayangkan umur saya berapa... Uh, Perumur berapa kan Setelah tamat persekolahan uh, Prof. Dr. Ho meneruskan pengajian uh, Bachelor uh, Sains Biologi Daripada U UKM Dan uh, dianugerahkan hadiah buku Pharmacology pada tahun 1992 Dan uh, kerana minat, minat beliau dalam bidang uh, Pengajian Biologi, Molekul dan Genetik Beliau telah menyambut pengajian Master Biotechnology di Universiti Melayu Pada tahun 1992 Dan telah menjalankan projek pendidikan berkaitan dengan Taxonomy Molekul Rumpai Perang That was the first project uh, Conducted by her Dan uh, dan seterusnya Beliau mendapat Biasiswa Mombusu uh, Ataupun sekarang dikenali sebagai Mombuka Kagusho Daripada Kementerian Pendidikan Kebudayaan uh, Sukan Sains dan Teknologi All under one ministry ya, dekat Jepun uh, Di Jepun untuk menyambung pengajian Di peringkat PhD di Chiba University pada tahun 1995 1996 I completed my PhD under Mombusu scholarship so <laughs> dan beliau menjalankan pendidikan bertajuk molecular cloning dan characterization of the genes responsible for the phosphorylated pathway of serine biosynthesis in uh, Arabidopsis Taliana di bawah Profesor Emeritus Dr. Kazuki Saito I believe that uh, Dr. Ho had got a very good training di Japan and uh, so did I uh, dekat Jepun uh, selalunya training tu sangat uh, komprehensif lah selalunya uh, jadi kerjaya Prof. Dr. Ho, uh, Ho bermula pada 1999 setelah menamatkan PhD dan beliau Dilantik sebagai pendidik pasca doktor di Jabatan Bioteknologi Fakulti itu Fakulti Sains Makanan dan Bioteknologi So we used to be together And, uh, Jadi dekat sini ramai kawan-kawan saya Daripada Fakulti Sains Makanan dan Bioteknologi yeah? Before being forced to split into two faculties And, and uh, But we can always uh, come back as a, as a faculty yeah? We just need a bridge between this building and the other building dan nah and many of my friends my good friends jadi uh, beliau kemudian dilantik sebagai pensyarah di Institut Bioscience UPM tahun 2000 dan beliau telah berkhidmat di Fakulti Sains Makanan dan Bioteknologi UPM pada tahun uh, 2001 hingga 2005 ya yeah. uh, dan seterusnya uh, bila berpisah 
dan beliau meneruskan tugas di Fakulti Biotechnologi dan Sains Biomolekul UPM bermula tahun 2005, 2005. Jadi di tahun 2005 adalah merupakan tahun di mana uh, satu fakulti berpisah menjadi dua fakulti kan? dan telah uh, mendapat uh, naik pangkat ke Profesor Madia pada 2007 dan kepada Profesor Penuh pada 2016 ya dan uh, beliau memang mengajar kursus-kursus yang uh, berbagai kursus uh, yang berkaitan dengan uh, molekular biologi ya uh, sidang hadirin yang dimuliakan sekalian jadi dengan pengalaman beliau selama 20 tahun dalam pengajaran dan penyelidikan beliau telah menyedia lebih 30 pelajar siswaza dari pelbagai negara dan telah berjaya menggraduatkan 26 pelajar siswaza dan 5 orang pelajar siswaza telah bergraduat dengan ijazah PhD dan 21 orang dalam ijazah master ini merupakan satu pencapaian lah, ya, yang besar uh, beliau juga telah dilantik sebagai ahli penyediaan bagi 40 orang pelajar dari Jabatan Fakulti dan Universiti lain uh, dan aktif dalam uh, sebagai pemeriksa dalam dan juga luar tisi luar uh, di peringkat dalam dan luar negara jadi kita uh, bergerak ke arah top 100 in fact we are targeting top 95 Ya, yeah, top 95 by 2025. Jadi memang saya rasa fakulti ini akan menjadi satu fakulti yang sangat penting, signifikan akan menyumbang banyak kepada pencapaian uh, uh, universiti, uh, khususnya dalam uh, aspek apa penerbitan berimpak tinggi, uh, commercialization uh, dan juga uh, networking dengan universiti-universiti utama dunia. Dan saya melihat uh, Prof Ho ini mempunyai networking yang kuat dan mereka beliau ada menjalankan projek bersama dengan Nekmati ya uh, dan uh, banyak projek-projek dalam negara dan luar uh, dalam negara juga dekat industri saya harap uh, 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 Prof Ho boleh uh, explore this opportunity uh, to work closely with top university top 100 universities in the world ya yeah? uh, uh, untuk kita meningkatkan uh, our reputation basically to achieve uh, improve our academic reputation yeah uh, academic reputation consists of about 40% contribute 40% of the total scores and jadi that's the reason why we want to have more collaboration with top universities but if you want to work with uh, other universities uh, we also encourage but hopefully uh, through that um, relationship too we can bring in more money lah yeah uh, to UPM jadi prof ada mempunyai kekuatan yang sangat kuat and uh, i think uh, we need uh, her knowledge and strength also skill juga untuk membangunkan khususnya uh, uh, which involve a seed development ya yeah? pembangunan seed ya yeah? that's why uh, RMC memberi special funding for that particular uh, project uh, di uh, kita park di bawah uh, Itafos so nanti saya minta uh, Prof Rafi juga invite uh, Prof Ho untuk sama-sama ya yeah? we are targeting this year kan yeah? Uh, so this year dah tinggal berapa bulan lagi kan dah, dah, dah berakhir dah berakhir tinggal berapa bulan baik we are targeting at least 10 uh, apa ni uh, new seeds ya yeah, being developed ya yeah, we did this a few, uh, few more months dan dengan kerjasama rakan sekerja di UPM dan universiti lain Prof Ho telah memohon telah banyak mendapat grant ada 28 grant dijadikan sebagai kutu projek dan secara komuniti beliau telah menerima lebih dari 4.5 juta uh, grant pendidikan daripada UPM jadi it's about time nanti to get uh, 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 more strategic funding. Uh, tadi saya difaham kau ada Datuk uh, Raha ada banyak funding dari Pemosti. Jadi go for it. Ya uh, define uh, what is the niche area of this faculty. Ya. Yeah? So that uh, kita kurangkan uh, sebab ada banyak juga projek-projek uh, yang dijalankan di fakulti lain. Jadi kalau boleh define uh, kekuatan fakulti ini uh, in line dengan dia punya the way forward for this faculty then apply for that particular project ya yeah, yang akan menjadi hala tuju fakulti ini pada masa akan dapat datang lah so saya rasa fikir uh, Prof Ho boleh mainkan peranan yang sangat penting melihat kepada kepakaran beliau dan achievement, achieve, achievement yang telah beliau capai uh, sehingga kini uh, dan beliau telah menerbitkan 130 kertas kerja dalam jurnal saintifik satu buku, lima jurnal uh, dan juga telah memfaikan lima pattern pendidikan Uh, jadi dengan kekuatan yang begini saya berharap uh, Prof Ho ada 5 6 orang menti. Uh, itu salah satu daripada emphasis saya adalah supaya tiap-tiap profesor ada menti. 
ya at least lima orang menti lah ya untuk kita groom ya uh, uh, supaya mereka juga mendapat satu tahap yang uh, tinggi ya ada menti saya harap saya I'm very sure that prof uh, ada ramai menti di bawah yang bekerja di bawah beliau jadi uh, dan uh, beliau juga uh, sangat aktiflah membantu fakulti dalam bidang kar pembangunan kurikulum dan sebagainya dan ini merupakan satu sifat yang terpujilah yang ingin kita uh, apa, UP, uh, UPM uh, berterima kasih atas sumbangan beliau uh, dan dia juga uh, aktif dalam persatuan jadi dalam, uh, jadi dalam tempoh 20 tahun kerjaya uh, Prof Ho telah menerima berbagai pengetahuan di uh, dalam dan luar negara dan uh, beliau merupakan penerima Fulbright Scholar ke Amerika pada tahun 2008 di mana beliau bekerjasama dengan Profesor Mayor Dr. Uh, Matt Gessler ya, mengenai kajian bioinformatik padi di Southern Illinois University uh, Carbondale jadi uh, saya lihat bahawa potensi itu banyak jadi minta juga Prof uh, explore further this uh, networking dan collaboration ya terutama dengan top university kalau orang tengok uh, kalau Fulbright Scholar ni jadi uh, orang tengok orang yang hebatlah dalam bidang pendidikan. Jadi kalau boleh kita leverage on this collaboration dengan top 100 universities dan juga collaboration dengan industry and bring in more money to help the faculty dan uh, ada strong collaboration. Jadi uh, we as much as possible uh, we want to establish more teaching factory in UPM. When we talk about teaching factory uh, there's a strong collaboration ataupun eh, participation of industry in UPM so our student can uh, after completing their first degree ataupun during their study they can uh, be part of the training ya yeah? jadi kita tengah membangunkan banyak teaching factory in fact faculty sign tak makanan yang sebelah ini juga tengah membangunkan satu uh, uh, teaching factory yang berkaitan dengan peperosan makanan jadi saya harap di faculty ini juga ada satu teaching factory yang kita yang menggabungkan kekuatan akademik dan juga kekuatan industri dalam satu building ya yeah, uh, dipanggil teaching factory dan pelajar kita akan dapat uh, the real working environment uh, in that particular uh, setting ya yeah. jadi uh, dengan pencapaian beliau jadi uh, hari ini uh, beliau uh, akan memberikan inaugural lecture jadi uh, sekarang mari kita mendengar Uh, syarahan inaugural Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Ling bertajuk Assembling the Jigsaw Puzzle of Crop Plants and Seaweed Functional Genomics So without further ado, please uh, welcome uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Ho Chai Ling Terima kasih kepada yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Nazamid bin Sari, Timbalan Knight Chancellor Penyelidikan dan Inovasi UPM. Okay, yang, yang berbahagia Profesor uh, Dr. Shuhaimi bin Mustafa, Dekan Fakulti Biotechnologi dan Sains Biomolekul UPM, Timbalan-Timbalan Dekan, Ketua-Ketua Jabatan, dan seterusnya para hadirin yang dihormati sekalian sama ada yang berada di Dewan atau di Facebook live streaming Selamat pagi dan selamat sejahtera Pertama sekali saya ingin mengucapkan selamat datang dan jutaan terima kasih kepada hadirin sekalian yang sudi meluangkan masa untuk menghadiri syarahan inaugural saya pada pagi ini saya juga ingin mengucapkan setinggi-tinggi penghargaan kepada seluruh warga fakulti dan pihak PSPK yang menjayakan majlis pada hari ini. Hadirin sekalian, izinkan saya untuk meneruskan syarahan saya dalam bahasa Inggeris.
ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to my lecture today. I'm glad to be here to share with you. You can't hear me? Sorry. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here to attend my inaugural lecture. I'm glad to be here to share with you my research journey in assembling the zigzag parcel of crop plants and seaweed functional genomics. This is the outline of my lecture today. I will start by introducing plant functional genomics and its importance, following by the research findings in uh, crop plants uh, functional genomics, including rice, oil palm, and seaweed. Last but not the least, I present to you the challenges in non-model plant functional genomics. Ladies and gentlemen, nucleic acid sequences hold the secret that determines the heredity and biochemical properties of a living organism. The development and innovation in nucleotide sequencing mark many important milestones in genetics and molecular biology, including the first generation sequencing in the 1970s, as well as the, sec uh, the next generation sequencing, including the second, third, and the fourth generation sequencing in mid-2000s. Well, if you look at the journey of nucleotide sequencing here. You see that at the initial year after Sanger sequencing was invented, only a few microorganisms have been uh, sequenced. The sequencing of more complicated genomes only started in the 1990s, followed by some model organisms such as uh, Aerodopsis for model plant of dicot rise uh, as a model plan for monocot in 2000s, year 2000s and onwards. Following the introduction of the second uh, generation sequencing, then we have more model plans and also the understudied plants genome to be sequenced. And there are many mega projects being launched. Uh, all this produce a lot of data because of the benefits of the new innovations in nucleotide sequencing, including affordable price, okay, an easier sequencing project, shorter completion time, and the new generation of sequencing produce more data. As of uh, June 2022, there are more than 23,000 uh, 23, uh, genomes from uh, eukaryotes being deposited in NCBI. This includes many plants and uh, also uh, algal genome. So what is the challenges in post-genomic era? The goal of uh, genomic research in the post-genomic era is to assign and characterize the function of all genes in a genome, not just a single gene, but all genes. I emphasize here, all genes in a genome. Assigning function to protein sequences or gene sequences depends on significant matches to homologous sequences from other organisms in the database. Unfortunately, a significant, a significant number of genes in a genome has non-significant matches or has no homology to sequences with well-characterized function. Therefore, large-scale functional analysis of genes is conducted to assign functions to unknown genes. That is the reason why functional genomics becomes so important in the post-genomic era. What is functional genomics? It is defined as a global scale analysis of the expression and gene functions, including the genic and non-genic regions, 
RNA and proteins. It uses high throughput forward and reverse genetics screens to study the relationship of phenotype and uh, genotype and phenotype or function. And it involves omics technology such as transcriptome proteome analysis that assign functions to all genes in the genome. Functional genomics is not a new area. It has actually started together or before genome sequencing because cDNA sequencing such as EST, the express sequence tag, is cheaper and it doesn't need complicated process for genome assembly. Functional genomic study is a large-scale analysis. Why is it important to have global-scale analysis of functional genomics? Because the aim or the goal of functional genomics is to assign functions to all genes in the genome. And the genome is big and with many and many genes. And functional genomics is able to provide a global view or a, a more complete, non-biased understanding of the genes in the genome. Next is about plant functional genomics. Why is it important to study functional genomics? There are many reasons that I can think of. As a plant molecular biologist, it's always my purpose and my interest to promote plant biology and plant molecular biology specifically. Plants serve as food, medicine, and it has industrial value. It also provides us with fuel, fiber, perfume, shelter, furniture, and many more. The plant functional genomics journey started in the 1990s together or concurrent with the sequencing of Arabidopsis thaliana. The publication on cDNA microarray and also EST or express sequence tag here were actually before the announcement of the genome sequence of Arabidopsis thaliana. Following that, the RISE genome has been announced in year 2002. This is uh, first, uh, the RISE genome first in, uh, was announced in, uh, for Japonica, then followed by the Indica. Okay. Since then, many tools and resources have been developed and established for the functional genomics analysis of model plants. The model plants here is uh, are about Arabidopsis thaliana and rice. Okay? Arabidopsis thaliana for the, uh, for, as a model plant for dicot plants, whereas the uh, rice as a model plant for monocot. The translation of knowledge from model plants to crop face great uh, difficulties because crop, crop plants have higher complexity. Okay. There are also unique features and uh, biochemical pathways that are not found in modern plants. The genome and transcriptome information are actually the missing jigsaw puzzle pieces on the functional genomics research of crop plants and other uh, non modern plants, such as seaweeds. Understanding gene function in crop species is critical for crop improvement. That is the reason why we need to develop tools and resources for the functional genomics of crop plants and also seaweed. Now, I would like to move on to share with you our findings in uh, rice functional genomics. Rice is a stable food for nearly 50% of the world's population, and more than 90% of rice is consumed in Asia. According to Kazana, a research institute in 2019, every one of us, Malaysian, 
consume 80 kilograms of rice per person per year. Okay? With the average yield of four metric ton per hectare, okay? we only manage, okay, Malaysia, we only manage to uh, fulfill 67% of self uh, uh, sufficiency level. Rice production faces many challenges, include low and uh, unstable productivity, biotic and abiotic stresses, climate change, lack of uh, quality seeds in terms of varieties and also certified uh, seeds, post harvest losses, weedy rice and uh, weeds, and also water sources and management. In my research, our lab aimed to uh, address the first problem, which is on the low and unstable productivity. That is why we work on rice grain filling. Rice grain filling is a critical factor directly related to rice yield. It involves accumulation of carbohydrates, protein, and lipids. It is determined by photosynthesis and carbon partitioning and can be influenced by physiological and environmental factor. Hence, it's a very complicated process. Although the rice genomes from Japonica Nippon Bari and uh, Indica 9311 from China have been sequenced since 2002. The knowledge transfer to local rice varieties is necessary because um, there are many differences in terms of SNP and so on. When we started our rice research under RMK8, MR219 was the new rice variety released by Mardi in year 2001. Rice MR219 has many uh, good uh, traits in terms of uh, yield potential, uh, grain weight, and also number of grains compared to MR84. In addition, it has a shorter maturation period. But unfortunately, MR219 was found to only have 71% uh, fertile spikelet. In another word, all these unfertilized uh, spikelet in MR219, they produce unfilled or partially filled grains. So in my research, we aim to understand the genes that limit the yield ceiling of MR219 to improve the rice production. To do that, we profile and we compare the two varieties, MR219 and MR84. MR219 has 71% uh, fertile spikelet, whereas MR84 has higher percentage of uh, fertile spikelet. So we extracted mRNA from MR219 and also 84, and we label with different fluorescence. Uh, and uh, in this uh, experiment, we mix uh, these RNA samples in equal amount and hybridize to NSF 20K rice nucleotide array. This NSF 20K rice nucleotide array was produced by Eric Hall, University of California. And in this array, there are, 20, there are more than 20 K rice nucleotide synthesized from the rice genes. Upon removal of uh, non-specific signals, the red and green signals from the array were analyzed and quantified. When you see the green signal here, it, it represents um, gene expression from MR84, and the red signals here represent the mRNA from MR219. And the intensity of the signal represents the transcript abundance on the microarray. 
By doing that, we have identified more than 380 differentially expressed genes. And uh, these genes contribute to the formulation of hypothesis towards the understanding of poor percentage of field greens in MR219. So in my next few slides, I'm going to tell you about the functional analysis of one of these candidate genes that we have uh, identified from cDNA microarray or the oligonucleotide microarray, which is known as BUT1 gene. Resinosteroid is a phytohormone that regulates plant growth and development. And Brasinosteroid insensitive one associated receptor kinase, or in short form, known as BUT1, is involved in the signal transduc transduction of uh, Brasinosteroid. It belongs to a, multi a multiple gene family, and many gene members of this family, they have uh, dwarf plants, they produce dwarf plants, and uh, many of them, they have uh, abnormality in plant development. What could be the phenotype of rice suppressing BUT1 from MR219? That is the question we want to answer. By using a transgenic approach, we produce rice suppressing BUT1 from MR219 which is without the kinase domain and C terminus compared to other members of this family. When we analyzed the uh, BUT1 RNA plants suppressing BUT1, we found that the transgenic plants produce more seeds or more spikelets compared to the untransformed plant. Unfortunately, when the number of seeds increased, the percentage of field spikelets decrease compared to the untransformed plants. So here you can see that from 71% of uh, percentage of uh, field spikelet, it has, uh, in the percentage has dropped significantly to 45% and 31% uh, in the RNA plants. And we, when we look at the uh, phenotypes of these plants, you see that there are many green spikelets at maturity compared to the untransformed plants. Histology analysis show that all these green grains that are, that are unfilled or partially filled, they actually have abnormality in the endosperm. The endosperm the, um, sorry, in, in the embryo. The embryo was either absent or they, they are partially, uh, they are only partially uh, uh, present in the rice grains. And these plants were also found to be insensitive to Bresnol steroid. And uh, they show uh, abnormality in leaf development due to the bulliform cells enlargement. From this experiment, we conclude that the BUT1 gene from rice plays an important role in the development uh, process of rice grain filling in leaf and also in uh, leaf cell. Realizing the importance of BUT1 gene in the development of rice grains, we proceed to identify genetic variation related to grain traits in this gene. From our analysis on a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNPs, we found 10 single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, related to grain weight, and nine uh, SNP markers related to grain width. When we tested all these, uh, when we analyzed all these SNP markers on uh, our local varieties, it was found that the frequency of allele A at this SNP position was actually higher among the Malaysian rice varieties that have low grain weight. By making use of the bioinformatic and, uh, data and also uh, morphological data in the SNP SIG database provided by the International Rice Research Institute, 
we identify the SNP markers in bug one gene and also uh, those SNP markers related to other green traits, color and tiller numbers. Why we are interested in color greens? Because uh, our upland rice varieties produce colored seeds or colored greens that have a high antioxidant uh, level, which is good for health. And uh, we are interested in tiller, which is a shoot with stem, root and leaf because we found that lowland rice varieties have higher yield and they have many tillers. Whereas the upland rice varieties, as you can see here, they have few uh, tillers and they have low yield. That is the reason why we are interested in identifying the SNP markers from uh, the database. From there, we proceed on to analyze the rice cis regulatory elements and transcription factors in rice sequences. Transcription factor is a protein that binds to short and specific DNA motif or known as cis regulatory uh, elements in the upstream sequence or the promoter of a gene. The binding of a transcription factor to the cis regulatory elements switches on the transcription of DNA uh, to, M to mRNA or the transcript here and regulates the transcription rate. So by using the omics data uh, in the database, we predict the uh, cis-regulatory element and also the transcription factor. There are three questions that we try to address. Number one, what are the biological significant cis-regulatory elements that regulates the core express genes in rice development and stress response? There are many short motifs or repeats that are distributed randomly in the genome. So in this objective, we wanted to identify or to differentiate the biologically significant cis-regulatory elements that are useful. We also want to find out how do copy number of cis-regulatory elements, the orientation, and also position of a cis-regulatory element in the promoter affect its effectiveness in gene regulation. But last but not the least, we would also like to find out the putative transcription factors that bind to all these cis-regulatory elements that we have identified. By using this workflow and the rice sequences, rice C, uh, cDNA microarray data, and also the, the database containing the uh, rice transcription, uh, transcription factors. We have identified no, normal, uh, novel cis-regulatory elements and also transcription factors corresponding to drought, salt, biotic stresses, and aerobic conditions, specific tissues, and developmental stage. This helped to prioritize candidate gene for genetic and biochemical analysis. And this information is useful for construction of synthetic promoters. After looking at the interaction between DNA and protein, now we move on to uh, the interaction between protein-protein interaction. It is important because some proteins function in a complex consisting of multiple proteins that interact with each other through protein-protein interactions. And they play roles in regulation of signal transduction. By using this workflow and the data in the public domain, such as uh, the right genomic sequence, and also the genome sequence database, we identify rice autologs. By matching the rice autologs 
through the interactome database, we predict the rise uh, predicted interactome. So this is how the the protein protein uh, networks look like. It is also known as rice interactome. This network consists of more than thirty seven thousand predicted interactions for more than four hundred of uh, uh, sorry more than four thousand rice proteins, including the homo interactions and hetero interactions that you see here. In the picture. This network extends known path pathways and improves functional annotation and, uh, of unknown rice proteins and networks in rice. This network can be viewed and uh, can be examined further from the rice interactions uh, viewer, which is uh, hosted by uh, the University of Toronto in Canada. In summary, taking advantage of resources that have been developed in rice, we have identified the rice green filling gene in MR219. We also have elucidated the gene functions of BAK1 gene. Meanwhile, we also look at the, the biologically significant rice cis regulatory elements and transcription factors in rice, as well as the rice protein protein interaction networks. In addition to that, we also have uh, identified SNP markers associated with rice agronomic traits. This will contribute towards crop improvement, moving towards breeding by design. We have shared the uh, publications, so it is hopeful that uh, the breeders can make use of the information and used for their breeding projects. Next, I would like to uh, move on to uh, our functional genomic research in oil palm. In this research, we focus on molecular interactions of uh, oil palm Ganoderma boninans. Palm oil contributes to 44% of the global oil production. And Malaysia is one of the largest producers and exporters of palm oil and kernel oil. The oil palm industry in Southeast Asia is threatened by a fungal disease known as basal stem rot, or in short, BSR. This BSR disease is caused by Ganoderma uh, that degrades lignin and cellulose. The symptoms of uh, Ganoderma include yellowing and collapsed fronds, the presence of white mycelium and fruiting bodies. And uh, here you can see the basal stem rot due to uh, Ganoderma uh, degradation. Eventually, the oil palms will collapse and die. BSR caused major economic loss to the oil palm industry in terms of yield reduction, loss of palms, and it also shortened replanting cycle and cost and incur more cost. The economic loss due to oil palm uh, uh, BSR disease was estimated to be 1.5 billion ringgit. The estimation was done based on 3.71% of infected palms in uh, 15, more than 59,000 hectare affected area. According to the most recent BSR survey in 2017 by MPOB, with 7.4% infected palms and uh, more than 200,000 hectare area affected by this disease, the economic loss is expected to increase. In our research, we focus on the molecular interaction of oil palm Ganoderma. When we talk about molecular interaction uh, between plant host and pathogen, there are two components. The plant host here is oil palm, whereas the pathogen here is Ganoderma. So in our research, we would like to know 
what are the oil palm genes being expressed during Ganoderma infection? And what are the fungal virulence genes or effectors being expressed in Ganoderma during the infection? This information is important for exploration, for markers, development, for disease detection, as well as molecular bleeding. The information will also help us to identify candidate genes for genetic engineering and to formulate strategies for BSR management. When we started this project in 2002-2003, uh, we faced many challenges because there is a lack of oil palm sequence. The first soy palm uh, genome sequence was only announced in 2013. To increase our uh, data or our knowledge on the gene sequences, we have generated express sequence tags from oil palm. We have uh, chosen to use this approach because it's cost effective compared to the whole genome sequencing. So EFTs are tagged for cDNA clones uh, from a cDNA library that we synthesize from the express genes. These short cDNA sequences are normally 300 to 500 base pair uh, produced from single Sanger sequencing run. These sequences can be annotated by homology search to, uh, produce, to uh, give us some hints on their putative functions. So in this project, we have produced more than 14,000 oil palm ESTs. By using these ESTs, we have produced oil palm cDNA microarray, consisting of uh, more than 3,000 cDNA probes. By using this in-house uh, cDNA microarray, we compare oil palm seedlings infected with Ganoderma with the uninfected oil palm seedlings. In this project, we managed to identify 61 candidate genes in the infected palms. 61 candidate genes is not a big number. But that was what we managed to do at that time due to many difficulties that we face in our research. When the second generation sequencing was introduced, so we proceed on to sequence the RNA from infected and uninfected uh, roots. In this experiment, we managed to uh, identify more than 1,900 upregulated genes and 1,200 downregulated genes. And these genes were found to be involved in many biological processes including those uh, involved in resistance, signaling, perception, uh, ion channel generation of uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, and so on. By mapping these genes to pathways, we managed to have a better understanding of the molecular interaction between oil palm and Ganoderma. This information will help with the formulation of strategy for BSR management. In addition to that, we also look at uh, the characterization of some of these uh, candidate genes that we have uh, isolated from uh, our RNA-seq experiment as well as the cDNA micro, uh, microarray experiment. All these uh, research will contribute to the identification of candidate genes for genetic engineering. The early symptoms of BSR are only observed in the roots because BSR is a root disease and the mycelium, the growth of mycelium and root necrosis are buried under the soil. So it is not easy to detect the disease. The manifestation of disease symptoms in above ground tissues only happen at late stage of BSR. Therefore, early disease detection is important for BSR management. 
so that the fungicide can be applied and palms can be removed. Now, can these transcripts that we have isolated or identified in the RNA-seq experiment to be used as markers for early detection of BSR? To answer the questions, good markers for uh, the detection of BSR must fulfill three criteria. Number one, ease of detection, because uh, Ganoderma is a root disease. So, if we want to dig the root from the soil, it will cause destructive sampling. Uh, it, would, it will affect the growth of the plant. So, a better strategy would be to test the marker or, or to detect the disease from the leaf samples. So, the questions that we want to ask is, are they being expressed in the leaves? Are these markers specific to basal stem rot disease? Do they produce consistent results? Because all these are important for marker uh, development. To examine that, we have carried out gene expression study of a list of uh, candidates' genes here. All these experiments are to answer these three questions. Are they differentially expressed in the leaves of Ganoderma infected oil palms? Are the differential, dis di uh, differential expression patterns specific to Ganoderma? Or they are also uh, expressed during the infection by other uh, organisms? Are the transcripts consistently up or down regulated? To answer this, we analyzed the gene expression of these markers across uh, 12 weeks because we do not want the markers to be expressed at 3 weeks but uh, subsequently they are absent or they, are, they only start to appear at week 12 and they are not useful uh, for the initial stage of uh, infection. From this experiment, we managed to find only two markers that fulfill all three criteria. However, in, uh, a few years later, an Indonesian group, they managed to uh, publish a paper that showed that uh, two of our markers, they, have potential uh, they can be potential positive markers for moderate tolerant oil palm varieties. The molecular interaction of uh, Ganoderma and oil palm will not be complete if we do not look at the other components, which is the, the pathogen. By analyzing the transcripts uh, in, in Ganoderma infected oil palm roots, we found many fungal transcripts, including those involved in uh, ergosterol biosynthesis, cell wall degradation, and also pathogenesis. And in the next few slides, I'm going to show you what we have done with some of these candidates' genes. We have uh, profiled the gene expression of uh, manganese proxidase and lacosase from uh, Genodalma in response to uh, jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, and also hydrogen peroxide. These experiments were carried out because uh, these two phytohormones, they are involved in plant uh, biotic stress. And uh, hydrogen peroxide is normally produced during uh, plant stress. In addition to that, we also analyzed the NEP gene on the necrosis and ethylene-inducing protein from Ganoderma boninans. We are interested in this transcript because the NEP has two functions. They can act as toxin as well as uh, involved in pathogenesis. We found that NEP from uh, Ganoderma can be upregulated by jasmonic acid and salicylic acid. And uh, by producing the uh, recombinant protein of uh, NEP, 
and treat them on uh, tobacco leaves, we found that NEP from uh, Ganoderma also co uh, caused chlorosis and necrosis in the leaf tissue. And besides that, they also cause cell death and production of ROS. In summary, transcriptome analysis of both oil palm and Ganoderma have facilitated the identification of many gene candidates for exploration of uh, marker development, disease detection, disease resistance, and BSR management. A comprehensive understanding of molecular interactions of oil palm ganoderma may open up opportunities for development of strategies to eradicate the disease and to enhance the tolerance or resistance of this important crop to our country. Functional characterization of gene candidates in both the host plant and the pathogen are still in progress. So the next few uh, slides, I'm going to talk about the civet functional genomics. In civet functional genomics, we focus on the agar biosynthesis. Agar consists of two components the agaropectin and agarose. Agaropectin consists of uh, alternating 1,3 link D galactose and uh, the 1,4 link alpha L galactose. Due to the uh, sulfate substitution in some of this carbon, uh, carbon in these two uh, residues, the agaropectin actually has low gel strength. In agarose, which consists of alternating 1,3-link uh, D-galactose and 1,4-link alpha 3 6 uh, anhydro l galactose the sulfate group has been removed from the 6 carbon. Due to that, it has high gel strength. And, uh, Agar or agarose with different gel strength have different applications. The highest grade of uh, agar or agarose can be used in our lab, in the molecular lab for gel electrophoresis. Whereas those uh, agar with lower gel strength, they are suitable to be used in food industries and also in pharmaceutical, uh, nutraceutical industries. Meanwhile, they uh, there are many, uh, the microbiology lab, the microbiologists here uh, among the audience uh, definitely have used uh, the agar for their culture uh, as well as the tissue culturists for plant tissue culture. And in recent years, the sulfated agar polysaccharides were found to have uh, interesting bioactivities that may be of uh, medical interest. The main source of agar is from the seaweed, especially those from the red seaweed. And Gracilaria is the principal agar uh, agarophyte harvested for global production of commercial agar. Agar polysaccharides extracted from uh, Gracilaria are highly sulfated. To improve the gel strength of uh, this agar from uh, Gracilaria, we can uh, carry out uh, alkaline treatment. The challenge in genetic improvement of this seaweed is due to the lack of molecular information. Here uh, are two photographs of the seaweed, Gracilaria Shanghai and Gracilaria Salconia, uh, that grow abundantly in the mangrove areas in West Malaysia. When we started this project, we have to optimize the RNA extraction method because the tissues from this seaweed have a, a lot of sulfated polysaccharides. And these sulfated polysaccharides, they, uh, they co-presentate with uh, the DNA and RNA. So we spent 
a year or so, working on the RNA extraction. RNA extraction, maybe, a, maybe it's a small matter to many of you, but for us to develop a method the, for RNA extraction from seaweed, it was a big achievement for us. Without that, we couldn't make the cDNA library, we couldn't produce the EST. And uh, by uh, using the RNA extracted, we managed to make a cDNA library and produce more than 8,000 uh, ESTs. But only 20% of them have significant uh, homology to the sequences in the database. In another words, 80% of them have no homology and we do not know what they are. By using 20% of, uh, of known uh, sequences, we managed to, uh, to map them to the uh, pathways and we identified some of the uh, key enzymes involved in uh, the building blocks. Okay? The building blocks, uh, UDP galactose and GDP L galactose that make up uh, agar. Knowing the pathway for the biosynthesis of uh, uh, the, the uh, knowing the, the, the pathways for the building blocks of uh, agar is not sufficient because these building blocks are uh, believed to be added to the backbone of agar, and this agar will be transported to the cell wall. In the process, there are many other enzymes involved, including the galactosyl transferase that add uh, this building block to the backbone, as well as the sulfur transferases that add the sulfate group to uh, some of these uh, carbon. And to produce agarose, sulfatase or sulfur hydrolases could be involved. The, these novel enzymes involved in agar biosynthesis in red seaweed are not found in modern organisms. Definitely, you won't find it in uh, Aerodopsis thaliana or in rice. Uh, since they are not uh, in the modern plants, we do not have any, they do not have any significant matches to existing database. So the homology search uh, approach is not useful to identify all these genes. We ask ourselves, are there any alternative ways to identify these novel genes? Well, to answer that, we ask another question. Is it possible to identify candidates' genes involved in agar biosynthesis from Gracilara Changai that have variable agar yields and gel strengths? To answer these questions, we try to produce or treat uh, Gracilara Changai in the lab under different conditions, such as uh, different salinities, different um, illumination uh, level, to produce uh, seaweeds with different agar yield and gel strength. And by comparing the gene expression of these uh, seaweed samples using the in-house cDNA microarray that we have uh, fabricated from our EST, we have identified uh, some of the genes involved in hypersalinity stress, hyposalinity stress. We identify genes that respond to uh, light deprivation stress what about the agar biosynthesis genes? We still do not have any information on that. After carrying out all this experiment, we managed to publish, but our aim was not achieved, was not being achieved. Right? Then we continue to ask other questions. Can the cleavage by, uh, of agar by beta agarase Okay. Increase the transcript abundance in enzymes involved in agar biosynthesis. Okay. Can sulfate deprivation uh, from the medium? Okay. Let's say we uh, remove the sulfate from the uh, from the sea, the sea water. 
will that actually upregulate genes related to agar gel strength? Because by removing the uh, sulfate, normally the agar will have a higher gel strength. We also asked, will comparative transcriptome of two Gracilaria species, the Gracilaria changai and Salinia, uh, uh, Gracilaria salicornia, this is a high, uh, uh, high yield and uh, high gel strength species compared to uh, low, low yield and low uh, gel strength species. Will that actually um, shed light on the genes involved in agarbar synthesis? To answer all these questions, we carry out RNA-seq analysis on the seaweed samples. And we also sequenced the partial genome of uh, Gracilara Changai for comparative genome analysis. And uh, from this analysis, we identified putative carbohydrate sulfur transferases and galactosyl transferases, sulfurylases, and many other genes uh, coding for the enzymes in the agar biosynthesis pathway. So with that, we managed to extend the agar biosynthesis pathways beyond the biosynthesis of agar building blocks here. So we have, now we have more information on this part rather than we stop here. Okay, at, at the moment, we are working on the characterization of this, some of these candidates' genes. We try to pro, uh, produce recombinant proteins uh, in yeast and characterize the enzyme activity. We would also like to reconstruct the agar biosynthesis uh, pathway in Chlamydomonas, which is a microalga. This is uh, uh, funded under the FRGS project. We hope to produce agar with different sulfate content that can be used for different industries. In our journey, in our long journey of discovery, okay, we also ask, are the markers, are the transcripts that we have identified suitable as markers for agar yield and gel strength. Because selection of commercially potential seaweed samples uh, using the uh, conventional method involves agar extraction and evaluation of agar properties. This process is time consuming, expensive and labor intensive. If we can uh, shorten this process by using molecular markers, we will be able to, uh, to estimate the agar yield and gel strength in seaweed samples in shorter time. To test some of these transcript markers, we collected and also we treated seaweeds under different conditions to produce uh, seaweeds with different agar yield and gel strength. From our experiment, we managed to identify transcripts, uh, transcript markers and also protein markers that are useful uh, for agar content and gel strength. In summary of uh, our seaweed functional genomics, the candidate's genes encoding for key enzymes involved in agar biosynthesis have been identified and characterized from the transcriptomes of Gracilara Changai by using different approaches. These candidates' genes will, further, will be further characterized for the reconstruction of agar biosynthesis pathway in microalga through uh, genetic engineering. A few of these candidates' genes have been tested to be suitable as transcript and protein markers for agar content and also gel strength. Well, coming to the last topic of my presentation, I would like to tell you some of the difficulties that we have experienced in the process 
The challenges in non-model plant functional genomics is mainly in the lack of resources in terms of genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic data. So we have to build our own uh, from scratch. And we also do not have databases. The available databases, which, is, uh, which are dominated by sequences from model, pla uh, from model plants, okay, they are not useful for the identification, for the homology search of unique genes in uh, some of these understudied organisms. Due to that, we have incomplete uh, gene annotation or gene function. Right? And we also lack of mo um, mutants for forward and reverse genetics as what we have in Aerodopsis thaliana and rice. Okay? We also do not have well-established protocols and materials. We can't uh, extract the RNA by using kit. Kit is not available to us. It doesn't suit our purpose of uh, uh, experiment. And we do not have uh, well-established uh, mat materials such as uh, microarray from Aerodopsis or from human. We don't have that. So we struggle with all this. And we do not we also do not have access to adequate research facilities, and we have to struggle most of the time. And due to all these difficulties, it takes time to build, so we have to be patient. Right? And because functional genomics is a large scale project, it's costly, it's expensive, and the research grant we get is always uh, insufficient. And we have to break down uh, the big projects into smaller pieces and then piece them together over time. Right? And sometimes we have to scale down the projects until uh, our results are inconclusive. You see? So we struggle. And this is a fundamental research. Most of the results cannot be turned into product and cannot be easily commercialized. It depends on uh, researchers who work on the downstream applications uh, to uh, commercialize or to uh, apply what we have produced. So income generation from the research may not be possible. Okay? And many of these crop plants and uh, understudied plants they are actually of regional or national interest, such as oil palm. Right? There is a very small research community. Okay? So not many publications. When we publish, not many people will cite us. Okay? Less competition, yes, we do not have to compete like the human research. Okay? Everybody is working on the same thing. Right? But we may have less impact. So, but there are reasons to work on the functional genomics of non-model plants because they have huge potentials. They have many unique genes, unique pathways. So by working on them, you find a lot of novel genes and uh, you may find a lot of uh, new discovery. Okay? It's an investment for a better future as well. If we don't do it, Nobody will do it. And it's necessary to move forward and to ensure food security. The zigzag puzzle of uh, crop plants and seaweed functional genomics is still incomplete. So you see many empty pieces here. There's much to be done to put these pieces together. But with the innovation of new technologies, with the effort from everybody, it's just a matter of time that we have more information of these understudied plants or crops. With that, I would like to uh, thank my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Kazuki Saito, who introduced me to uh, the functional genomics of Aerobopsis thaliana. 
I joined his lab in 1995 when the ESTD clones were, for, were first offered to uh, the research community to work on. Right. And uh, I would also like to thank Professor Noji Masaki. He worked with me in the lab for one year during my PhD. So he shared uh, a lot of technical um, tips with me. Uh, I would also like to thank Professor Dr. Pang Siu Moi. She introduced, she introduced me to uh, seaweed research. This was taken uh, during our field trip uh, to Johor and uh, in uh, Singapore. Okay. Together with uh, Prof. Kiki Pang, they supervised uh, my project for M Biotech. I would also like to thank Associate Professor Dr. Matt Geisler. He shares his lab facilities as well as his ideas in bioinformatics with me during uh, my stay in his lab uh, under the Fulbright Scholarship. I would like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to Professor Dr. Wira, Dr. Raha Abdurrahman, who is here, okay. for her support and always give me good advice whenever I seek her opinion. And I would also like to thank Dr. Hari Krishna Kulavara Singham, who is not here today. He is represented by Professor Jennifer N. Hari Krishna. He took me in as his postdoc uh, in 1999 when I first returned from Japan. He was the one who introduced me uh, to oil palm research. And thanks to the uh, research grants, um, Dr. Hari and uh, Professor Dr. Jennifer and Hari Krishna, they entrusted me when uh, they left UPM. I have a good start in my career. Thank you. I would also like to thank Professor Dr. Ho Yin Wan. She was the one uh, who checked my first two proposals that I submitted to MTSF and IFS. She gave me very honest uh, comments and it, uh, all her comments helped me to improve my proposals. Okay. To my students, I would like to thank you because you have trusted me to guide you during your uh, postgraduate study and also your FYP project. Thank you very much. They have stand by me. They have uh, gone through a lot with me. They share uh, all the glories and all the unhappiness. Okay? We have gone. Th uh, they share the. Uh, I learn from their success and their failures. So every one of them is important to me because through them I grow. Okay? I try to include everybody's uh, uh, face here from uh, uh, the archive that I have. I hope I didn't leave anybody out. I'm sorry I can't present all your good work because uh, of time limitation. Okay, I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, the funders for my project. Ministry of Higher Education, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, University Putra Malaysia, Malaysia Palm Oil Board, Yayasan Ferda, IFS, MTSF, Fulbright Malaysia Scholar Program, Macy. Okay, I would also like to thank Cordon Genomics for uh, helping me to uh, analyze the oil palm RNA seq data and uh, also uh, the, uh, the Science Vision Sindriyan Burhat. Uh, they provide me support in uh, analyzing the partial genome analysis. Okay. I would like to acknowledge the contribution of all my collaborators from uh, University Putra Malaysia, Malaya University,
Utah College, uh, uh, sorry, Utah, you know, Utah, UCAM, MPOB, Mardi, Cotton Genomics, Southern Illinois University of Carbondale, Tokyo University. Okay. Last but not the least, I would like to thank uh, the Faculty of Biotech and Biomolecular Sciences for the support given to me over the years, especially the deans and deputy deans of uh, the faculty, the heads of Department of Cell and Molecular Biology, uh, academic staff, non-academic staff. Thank you to the organizing committee of uh, the faculty for my inaugural lecture. I would also like to thank Professor Tatin Paduka, Khatija Muhammad Yusuf. Sorry, your name was misspelled. And uh, Professor Dr. Tan Wenxiang, Professor Dr. Lai Oiming for checking my inaugural uh, book. I would also like to uh, acknowledge the contribution from uh, colleagues from the Institute of Plantation Studies, Institute of Tropical Agriculture, UPM uh, Press, uh, and also PSPK. Last but not the least, my family, who provides me unconditional support, who allows me time to explore uh, my research. Thank you for your attention. I have another slide. <laughs> Please join us at FGSV 2022, the fourth international symposium and workshop on functional genomics and structural biology. This is organized by my department. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Majlis merakamkan ucapan terima kasih kepada yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Ling atas syarah inaugural beliau pada pagi ini. Seterusnya, majlis sekali lagi ingin menjemput yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Nazamit Saari, Timarat Chancellor untuk sesi rumusan syarah inaugural pada pagi ini. Terima kasih. Wow, after, I, after listening to her presentation, you know, sharing with us uh, her journey of uh, plant functional genomics. Uh, in particular, working on uh, rice uh, disease due to uh, Ganoderma and also seaweed. I can see the potential of this research. I wish to talk to you after this. <laughs> you know, you see, have you heard about GG, uh, GWG? You haven't heard about GWG? GWG is the biggest seed producer in Malaysia, producing more than 60% of seed and also they export their seed to all over the world. They hired 40 plant breeders and the orders is 80 years old. And on the 26th, on the 26th of uh, uh, this month, they will be launching uh, fragrant rice in Perlis. Fragrant rice in Perlis. You know, uh, Professor Rafi uh, has got two uh, patterns on Putra 1 and Putra 2. Putra two and he produced Putra 1 produce, uh, produce about uh, 9 to 12 metric ton per, uh, per hectare. And Putra 2 also about the same, 9 to 12. And if you look at in Sarawak, you are not from Sarawak, kan? Prof. Ho, kan? Uh, you are from Kajang. In Sarawak, you know, they are producing like about 2 metric ton per hectare. So we really need soil scientists as well to look into reconditioning of soil. Now, 
uh, we have a very big project in Sarawak, you know, working closely with SEDC, you know, and we are planting basically rice for Sarawak and Plateau. At the same time, we are also looking into uh, grain corn. So it's all about food security. And with your knowledge, basically, in, in molecular biology, very strong in molecular biology, you can turn it into translational uh, research, you know, that will give a strong impact to the nation in addressing the issue of uh, food security. You know, I'm also working on, uh, you know, Azola. Have you heard about Azola? Which is one of the main ingredients, main ingredient to produce, uh, to produce uh, uh, animal feed. Azola, kan? Azola pinata. Yeah? Azola pinata. Very cheap, basically. High in protein. But uh, basically, I'm working on protein. You know, I'm not a molecular biologist, even though I understand uh, a bit about molecular because my mentor is there, Professor Datuk Raha. <laughs> I, I used to work in a lab, man. you can use whatever by chemical, so that's why I really appreciate her effort. You can use whatever chemical I have in the lab, but once finished, please replace it. <laughs> okay, that's very good. That, that, that was a really a good deal. And, uh, that's why we, call, we refer to him, somebody with a big heart, you know, offering per. And when uh, Prof. was mentioning about about all the facilities, you know, with our knowledge, with our knowledge wrong, very fundamental knowledge, if you can turn this, you know, into translation, translational research, you can be in million. With that million, you can, you know, uh, flood uh, this faculty with all the cutting edge uh, equipment, all this. Uh, but I need to talk to you, I need to talk to you. Huh? Recently, I secured 3.28 million grant, you know, and part of the, 70% to be used uh, to be used for equipment to purchase high end equipment you know but maybe you cannot see the potential but i can see the potential that's why i'm excited now after listening to your uh, work you know all this uh, but if you can work you know because uh, fundamental research is very important it can go hand in hand with uh, translation research because even if you uh, is emphasized at least 50% of research has to be into uh, translational research. You know, at the end of the day, we, there must be an output in all this. You know, so uh, I hope, you know, uh, but I believe that uh, yeah, you can, I believe that you can do wonders, you know, after listening to you, focus, especially research. You know, people can produce like fragrant rice of uh, Dr. Chua, uh, you know, used to live uh, abroad for for 20 years before coming back here and establish GWD to produce because C is the in thing. That's why we have been doing a lot of things basically in UPM now. You know, that's why we want to establish what we call it factory, uh, teaching factory. Uh, There's a, a one of its kind basically in UPM and uh, so that okay, we can expose our students to real uh, teaching environment. And So anyway, uh, say uh, mengambil kesempatan ini mengucapkan uh, tanya lah uh, kepada Prof Ho for the very interesting uh, inaugural lecture. Uh, uh, ada yang faham, ada yang saya tak faham. <laughs> ada yang tak faham, tapi banyak juga yang faham lah. Uh, because I understand that in order to produce good seed, basically there must be three component which is very important. What are the component? Number one must be good in molecular biology because they got to produce markers. And I learned also through my mentor. Dr. Narayan is not here, how to produce markers from grain, rice grain, you will produce markers. So Dr. Chua has been producing uh, markers, artified markers for individual uh, uh, different grain that they are working on. Uh, kemudian juga must be good in genetics and must be good in crop science. These are the three components you know, that can turn your research into uh, translational research and you can bring million to the faculty with your knowledge. Yeah? So I hope I can see you uh, soon as possible uh, to discuss further and let's see how can we progress from there. Yeah, of course we cannot live in silo and one more. We are all top gun here, uh, Dr. Prof. Kety, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Kety and also Prof. Raha, you know, very close to Mosti. So let, let, let uh, us leverage on them and I'm sure Prof. Dr. Raha is more than willing to help us. Yeah, so uh, with that, uh, once again, Saya mengucapkan taniah dan terima kasih kepada Prohu dan saya mengucapkan uh, terima kasih kepada semua yang hadir memberi sokongan uh, kepada beliau pada 
uh, pagi yang berbahagia ini dan saya juga ingin menyampaikan salam uh, daripada uh, Datuk Naib Chancellor yang tidak dapat hadir uh, pada uh, pagi ini uh, kerana beliau ada urusan yang uh, penting yang beliau perlu hadiri. So dengan itu saya sudahi dengan wabillahi taufik wa hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Majlis merakamkan setinggi-tinggi penghargaan kepada yang berbahagia Timan Naib Chancellor atas kesudian beliau mempengerusikan dan merumuskan syarat inaugural pada pagi yang barakah ini. Mohon yang berbahagia Timan Naib Chancellor untuk kekal yang sebentar. Seterusnya, majlis dengan hormatnya menjemput barisan ahli pengurusan fakulti bersama yang berbahagia Prof. Dr. Ho Chai Ling untuk naik ke pentas bagi sesi penggambaran bersama yang berbahagia Timbalan Naib Chancellor. Terima kasih diucapkan kepada yang berbahagia Timan Naib Chancellor dan sekalian ahli pengurusan fakulti. Mohon yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Ho untuk kekal di atas pentas. Mohon yang berbahagia Prof untuk uh, Prof Ho untuk kekal di atas pentas. Hadirin sekalian, majlis dengan sukacitanya ingin menjemput para pelajar dan alumni pelajar selian yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Ho Chai Lin atas pentas bagi sesi fotografi. Bersama di daki Terima kasih semua.